We have Roger Wolf with us, who uh, currently is Director of Environmental Programs and Services for the Iowa Soybean Association and Executive Director of Agriculture Clean Water Alliance. He is responsible for leading the creation, development, and oversight of programs and services designed to advance architectural leadership in, in achieving data-driven environmental performance at farm and watershed scale, while maintaining or improving agronomics and economic performance. A, pr a primary goal of these programs is to provide tools and systems that enable the farmer to provide environmental solutions and services. Uh, Roger has over 23 years of agricultural resource management experience and holds a BS in geography and, at the University of Iowa. Despite that, he's still here. I will, uh, I'm in, indebted to Roger because when I first called him, actually to see if uh, somebody else could speak, um, they ended up uh, having a management summit and uh, ended up sending the big guy here. So uh, we're, we're indebted to that. And uh, uh, the coffee is fresh, so uh, feel free to load up. And uh, after this, we may or may not have a Q&A for the entire uh, program. So Roger. Thank you. Okay, thank you uh, for asking me. Boy, that's uh, it's, uh, actually a tough act to uh, follow here with all the speakers. And um, coming up to Minnesota, uh, you know, I've been a student of um, water quality for 23 years, as my bio said, and I worked in uh, local soil and water conservation district office, really, um, and, and it said my background's in geography, but my real education uh, I like to say came from sitting at the kitchen table with farmers because as Dave said I believe farmers want to do uh, the right thing it, it, you know you always hear it's their water uh, they recreate they drink uh, the last thing they want to do is be um, uh, you know the reason for the problem and and so um, what I'm here to do it's gonna be a little different presentation than everything else uh, what I told uh, Mike uh, that I would do is is share the story, uh, the motivations, the drivers that, that we have in Iowa, uh, the experiences. And I, I think, and I, I did an interview with uh, Minnesota Public Radio, and, and she was asking the question, what's different about Iowa versus Minnesota? And, you know, I, I was a little bit caught off guard on the question, but uh, as, I, as I sit here today, you know, there's a lot of things different. The land of 10,000 lakes. Um, you know, frankly, Minnesota's been working on water quality uh, issues for quite some time, right? Um, 1972, the Clean Water Act, uh, the formation of the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and and literally, I think I, I don't know what the number is, but I would guess you probably have literally hundreds of groups working. Uh, on conservation and environmental issues. Now you go down to Iowa, um, we, we don't have a lot of data, we don't have a lot of information, and, and uh, agriculture is the economic driver in Iowa. We don't have 10,000 lakes. That might surprise you, but... Um, so it's, it, it, is, it is significantly different. So let me get into this, hopefully this will work. Anybody know which button you push? <laughs> ah, that one, the right, the right button. Okay, so as I said, this is just an overview. And uh, I'll try to go through this pretty rapidly and, and wrap up uh, your day. But um, I am from agriculture. I'm proud of it. I am from Iowa. I'm proud of that. Um, I don't, I'm not coming up here to stick a finger in anybody's eye. Uh, but it's a, it's a $20 billion cash receipt industry to state economy. We lead the country in soybeans, corn, uh, hogs, and, and eggs, might surprise you. Uh, soybeans, I, we like to say our biggest customer is a pig. Um, and uh, a, a lot of soybeans go into uh, poultry. So um, in Iowa, we raise uh, about 10 million acres of soybeans annually. That's 500. Uh, about 500 million bushels. Uh, I don't know, soybean farmers, what's the cash price today? 
1330, okay. So 10, you know, 500 million bushel, you can do the math, I haven't done it, but um, there's 23 million acres of row crop agriculture in Iowa. That's a, in a, typically in a corn soybean rotation. Um, and that land is selling for roughly six to $8,000 an acre. So it's a, it's a, big, uh, a big, big deal to Iowa. Uh, we heard earlier today about how land use has changed. Um, that's that's uh, it's not really news. I mean, we see it. Um, but there from 1920 to 2000, uh, upper Midwest dominated by this privately owned landscape. Uh, as we heard, it's tile drained. 70% of that 23 million acres is tile drained. Uh, we started back in the early 1900s. I saw once uh, an article in the uh, New York Times, 1917, that stated that uh, the investment to drain the Iowa landscape was exceeded the cost to build the Panama Canal in 1917. And one of the bigger promoters of draining the landscape was James uh, Hill, I believe, uh, from Minnesota. And, and so, you know, you start thinking about these drivers, you know, how, how do we uh, gain value out of a, a wet landscape. And if we didn't have tile drainage, we wouldn't have productive croplands. Uh, clearly, management of these uh, systems impact water. I don't think there's any denying it. Um, in, Ag in Iowa, we're just 23 million acres of land. Um, and and I just reiterate that point, uh, it's, it's an agriculture landscape. It's, it's used for corn and soybean production. It's used for livestock production. Finding mechanisms to increase management capabilities, in my view, is key. Management is the operative word. Uh, if we're going to uh, see changes in how the system responds, and we, we heard a lot of presentations today about the system and how big and complex the system is, and, and understanding that system is, is a big part of the science. That's where models, that's why models exist, uh, to, to try to mimic how that system responds. And, and so as we get to agriculture, looking at the management capabilities, that's a big part of it. And Dave did a good job of talking about that. It's going to be a little different presentation because nutrients, uh, sediment's still a big deal, but really more locally it's, it's the issue. Uh, but um, nitrogen and phosphorus, the big deal in Iowa. Uh, no big surprise, it's correlated with land use. Um, organically rich uh, uh, landscape, tile drained, 34 to 48 inches of rainfall. Uh, if you want to work on nitrogen issues, you're going to come to the upper Midwest. You're going to work in the corn belt. And uh, that's, that's uh, what we're seeing. Here's just another slide looking at the Mississippi River Basin. And it shows uh, the, the areas for nitrogen and and uh, phosphorus and then ranks uh, the states down below. Um, we have issues locally as well. The city of Des Moines, and, and actually uh, really 15 years of my career, have been spent working in the Des Moines and the Raccoon River watershed. And the city of Des Moines has probably been in the spotlight uh, probably more so than any other source water uh, uh, user uh, they use the Raccoon River as its primary uh, source for drinking water. This is a picture of the, the world's largest nitrate removal plant. Uh, the capital cost to install that nitrate removal plant was about $6 million, and the surface water quality, uh, where it passes the intake in Des Moines, will exceed the 10 milligrams per liter drinking water standard about 100 days a year. So they'll have to treat the volume of water they need to service about 500,000 customers. So there, this, this is an illustration of how the local water quality uh, and nitrogen uh, is um, impacting uh, the state of Iowa and, and, and obviously, you know, Des Moines is state capital. So it's a high profile situation. Uh, here's some data, 1990 to 2009, uh, just Average uh, nitrate concentration, 10 milligrams per liter is the drinking water standard. And you can see basically over that time it's, it's jumped 
around. And of course, concentration is not, is not the same as loading, um, but you can see how it fluctuates from year to year. And, and of course, that's driven by primarily the weather and the volume of water. Uh, this is the one, I think I have one sediment slide. I took a couple slides out, but I wanted to show you this. This is some actual data uh, from the Des Moines Water Works where they uh, were able to uh, translate this into sediment. They, they take water quality samples for total suspended solids and they were able to uh, convert this to sediment. One of the things that's interesting here is that in 1916, you can kind of see beginning over on the left and then going to the far right. And, and, and I heard uh, presentations today talking about how the stream may become uh, into equilibrium. And beginning in about 1985, you can see how the total suspended solids shifted. And one of the things we're working on uh, looking at this data set is is it possible that we're seeing a response to the impact of, of uh, conservation adoption in the watershed and, and maybe the stream has, has made a significant adjustment. And so we're in the process of analyzing this data and we're gonna be publishing some papers uh, with Des Moines Water Works on, on this. Okay, a little bit about the Soybean Association. Um, for those of you that aren't familiar with commodity organization, we develop policies and programs that help farmers expand profit opportunities. We are in business to make money. And I have no illusion of that. I work at the pleasure of a group of 21 elected farmers. And uh, if, if, if we're not profitable, um, number one, I'm not gonna have a job. Number two, um, then, uh, it's, it's highly unlikely that they will be able to make any investments in, in conservation and environmental protection. Um, the uh, environment, um, historically, the Soybean Association has had a, a strong in level of engagement in the 90s. I was self-employed, I was a consultant, I worked on the Raccoon River watershed and Soybean Association was one of my clients. And uh, in, in about 2000, they came to me to design the environmental uh, programs and, and services program. Uh, a lot of that I've told you uh, down at the bottom here, I added some slides just, just to look at the economic impact. It's just Iowa uh, soybean crop alone accounted for 3.36 billion in US trade exports. That was a record. Uh, 16,000 jobs and 632 million in labor income. So obviously <coughs> agriculture is important and, and I just you know, want to reiterate that and frankly uh, we're proud of that. Um, the environmental programs and services uh, area is part of the ISA strategic plan. Um, it, it falls under stabilizing and increasing yield while, while improving production efficiency in the environment. It's about uh, a leadership program, um, developing, implementing, and promoting programs. And so we're in the doing business. Um, you know, we're not in the business of sending someone to attend a meeting and, and, and be kind of a token uh, stakeholder sitting at a meeting. We're in the business of going in the watershed and, and helping bring added capacity uh, to the stakeholders that are, that are trying to do this work, the soil and water conservation districts and the, and the agencies and so on. So I'm going to uh, give you some, some examples of some of our work here in a minute. Um, the, our, our motivations for this, you know, when I first started, farmers said, you know what, uh, I've been using conservation resource management for a long time. And, you know, we, we've all been to the field days. That's been the typical way of, of uh, diffusing technology and innovation. Uh, that will continue. But for a lot of farmers, um, they believe they're already doing a good job. But what they've lacked is the data and information to show their diligence. They can't prove that they're saying what they're doing, nor can they prove what they're doing is having an impact on 
the environmental outcomes. And, uh, is Don still here? Yeah, the agencies also are having difficulty being able to prove their impact. And he mentioned the SEAT program. And, and if, you're, if we're all taxpayers, I assume, I don't know who gets out of that, but um, the taxpayers want confidence that the, the solutions that we're devising, the practices that we're taking, they want confidence that that money's being spent wisely and that we're getting an impact. And so when this program first started, it was about helping farmers prove their diligence, first and foremost. It was also about taking science and technology and applying that science and technology to gain an understanding so that we can have hope for an impact. These, the, the, the problems that we're talking about exceed the expectations that we have had for conservation. We're talking about environmental objectives downstream. Uh, we have a long history of applying conservation, but as, as Don said, you know, we have extreme events here today. You know, what kinds of systems can we design, develop, and deploy? And uh, so, so these are more complex questions. We're getting off the farm and, go, and going to the watershed level. And I would like to say that I think we're at the ground floor of really making watershed management implementation work. And I would also say, despite the fact that we have a long history of working on clean water, the non-point source question is really basically unwritten policy space. And we're, we're as much in the business right now, in my view, of defining how we can actually achieve performance uh, addressing the non-point source issues. Frankly, they, they're, they've been, they're complex. The 72 Clean Water Act, they decided to do the low-hanging fruit, the point source issues. And we've spent a lot of money dealing with those over the, you know, the 40 years. And now we're moving into the non-point source arena. Uh, we, we also need to look at the spatial issues. We're going to cross multiple scales. You know, we're talking about individual farm fields, groups of fields within a farm, and now multiple farms within a, a watershed. So we have to be able to cross multiple scales, hence the field, farm, and watershed uh, publication that you see there. We also know that we need to value cooperative partnerships. Um, you know, we want to work with USDA. We want, we want to work with the agencies and we want them to be successful. Um, and then obviously we want to provide value to the membership of Iowa, Iowa farmers. And um, uh, in, in 2010, I know that's small print and I don't intend for you to, uh, to read through all those things, but in 2010, uh, these are all the, the contracts and projects that we've worked on. I have a multitude of funding sources. Um, in, in 2010, we had about $650,000 of checkoff investment. We leveraged that uh, for a total uh, budget of about $2.1 million last year. Uh, we have eight staff working on the environmental programs and services area, uh, from environmental scientists to uh, watershed planners to technical service providers that, that are certified crop advisors to water monitoring people. Uh, to uh, myself, which is not a scientist, but an administrator now. Um, and, and so over the time frame, 2000 to 2010, uh, we've, we've uh, leveraged the soybean checkoff investment, about $8 million to the, the 2.7 invested. Just the current scope and scale um, across Iowa, Two, we're currently working on 200 farms, 26 different defined watershed areas. Some of those are the larger scale uh, Huck 8 watersheds. Um, the Huck is a way to define the size of a watershed. It's the watershed address, so you have eight digits in the number, so that gives the uh, address. And if you need more explanation on that, I'll be uh, here afterwards. But, uh, the more targeted watersheds are at the Huck 12 scale, and so, and I heard the, the, the uh, presentation earlier today, the first presenter, uh, talking about making it local, and that's what we've been doing. Um, but as I said before, we didn't have any data to start from. So 
Here's some highlights from our program. We have uh, a program called CEMSA, C-E-M-S-A, stands for Certified Environmental Management Systems for Agriculture. It basically applies the USDA uh, uh, resource management criteria. Uh, we also modeled it after the internationally recognized standard 14001 ISO standard. It's basically a total quality management approach to uh, environmental management. It, it critically looks at resource issues. It helps a farmer prioritize what's most significant on their farm. They develop an action plan to address those issues. Um, farmers like this approach because they go through it, they have an assessment where they're currently at, they look at what the standards are for NRCS, they have it in hand, they can walk into NRCS and and apply for uh, EQIP or CSP or state cost share. So uh, this is one of the programs that we have. Um, we also, uh, I have a contract with this group called Agriculture's Clean Water Alliance. I'm, I serve as their executive director. This is a group of 13 ag retailers. These are your large cooperatives that are organized in the Des Moines and the Raccoon River Basin. They sell and apply most of the fertilizer sold to farmers in, that, in those basins. Um, they have decided that they want to be proactive. Um, they were looking for capacity. Um, the ag retailers were also one of my clients in the 90s. And, uh, and so it was fortunate that we were able to bring them on to add to the work at the Soybean Association but you see their mission is to reduce nutrient loss, specifically nitrate from, from leaving farm fields and entering the tributaries. And, and so this is a agriculture trying to be proactive. The interesting thing about this is the retailers are all competitors. But in concert, they, they agreed that they have this uh, another vision or another mission in addition to helping the farmers apply technology and and sell fertilizer and sell crop services, they're looking at the water quality objectives. And so one of the things they provided support for is, is because we didn't have data, was a comprehensive water monitoring program. And frankly, the state doesn't have the resources to, to really collect the data. And without the data, we wouldn't know where to work. Um, so this is just shows the spectrum of water monitoring. Um, we have what's called certified sampling. It's, it's conducted under a quality assurance, quality control uh, plan developed uh, in concert with the Department of Natural Resources. Um, we do some real-time monitoring uh, using uh, some probes that gives us, uh, it's, uh, gives us um, well, it's really a better way to describe it is near real-time because we have to go through a process to qualify the data. But, um, we do investigative monitoring when events are occurring. You know, this, this whole monitoring business, you have to have monitoring that's capable of looking at flow, looking at quality. Um, so this is a significant investment, and I'm sure the, the researchers in the room and the agencies uh, would all tell you just uh, uh, how comprehensive the monitoring has to get so that you can, so that it, the data becomes useful. Uh, you, we want to know, we want to be able to document the current uh, conditions, we want to know, we want to create a baseline, we want to uh, be able to target and go in to the places where we have significant issues. Then we want to do effectiveness monitoring. We want to know, are the practices we're applying actually performing? And so we do above and below, we do uh, a, a paired design. Um, and uh, so you have to have monitoring that's out there during the event because you're not going to send a staff person to go out and collect the sample in the, in the middle of the night. So you have to have automated equipment. Uh, this is just some raw data, nitrate, uh, 99 to 2007, uh, all the tributaries. Uh, site number five, it's kind of interesting, site number five is right here. Uh, one of the things we detected was one of the watersheds in the headwaters of the raccoon was... Uh, actually uh, picking up affluent discharges from the point source. And so that the watershed, the highest in the Raccoon River Basin was some point source discharge. And 
you know, we weren't monitoring for that. And so in this case, you know, farmers and agriculturists were pretty excited because they said, wow, look, it's not us, it's them. And, and uh, so you kind of go through this, this dynamic. The reality is, is that this is at the headwaters and by the time it gets downstream, it's, it's, it's like, a, I don't know, excuse me, it's a kind of a fart in a hurricane, right? So the point source dischargers are really pretty small when you look at the volume of, of water coming from, from agriculture. So, uh, but this does enable us to go in and target. So we can spatially look at this data. Uh, we know the North Raccoon subwatershed is contributing more nitrate than the middle and the south. We were able to go into specific subwatersheds. Uh, here's some, some water quality data uh, just from last year. The drinking water standards uh, illustrate <clears throat> illustrated. Well, one of the things we found out is that uh, water management, water flow has a, a large uh, impact on the volume of nitrate flowing down the river. So, so this issue is going to be a lot more complex when you start thinking about how you're going to manage the water. How are you going to manage the volume of water? By the time you get down to Des Moines, this last year, we did not exceed the drinking water standard, but we had a large volume of water flowing out of the river, so the loading was high. Okay, so we, we, we know places to work. Now we're at the smaller scale sub-watershed. Uh, I have a watershed planner on staff, and so he's designing watershed plans. What we do is we bring uh, uh, comprehensive assessment and planning facilitation Oftentimes we'll package the, uh, the planning work, the SIMSA program or the resource management system planning. We do management evaluations. Um, I'll show you an example of that in a minute. We do the environmental evaluation, the water monitoring deployment, whether we're at the fields, edge of field scale, uh, the sub-watershed scale, or at the tributary scale. We apply targeted conservation systems with the farmers but like bioreactors, shallow wetlands, and others. And then we, we, we provide this technical service contract. So we package all these, these, these approaches which provide technical assistance. And, and we're doing this in concert. Not, we're not doing this alone. We're doing it in concert. We're one of lots of other groups uh, sitting at the table. Uh, vitally important there, NRCS, uh, the uh, Ag Research Service, the folks that implement the SEED program for USDA, vitally important to have those scientists on board. Um, the RC&Ds, uh, which were actually zeroed out, I believe, in the, the, the last budget, were vitally important to um, us in Iowa, and, and uh, we worked with them. Um, Watershed planning, uh, just what goes into that, you're looking at available data, it's, it's a facilitated process. When you get, you know, when you get local, uh, you know, not everybody understands these issues, right? Farmers wanted to know what was in their water when we went local, and, and we didn't have any data to begin with, so they actually got invested in, into uh, looking at the water quality, starting to collect the samples, and, and so on. Um, integrated solutions, uh, the reality is there's no silver bullet. Um, I, I don't want to reiterate that enough. I mean, I mean um, this is complexity, um, and uh, you know, we're going to have to adapt, in my view, how we're actually going to achieve performance. It's going to be a multitude of approaches, but it's going to involve assessment planning, monitoring, and, and so on. Um, we've actually written five watershed plans using uh, the state uh, planning protocols, incorporating NRCS planning procedures. Um, I'd be happy to show you any of these plans if, if you're interested. One of the things that went into the assessment, we, we did a, uh, it's called RASCAL, uh, working with the Department of Natural Resources. We actually used their equipment. Uh, my staff went out and we, we walked the entire stream length and documented the stream bank condition. And uh, that's what RASCAL stands for, Rapid Assessment of, along, of Stream Condition Along Length. I always have to look at it when I read it. Um, 
results of this assessment are intended to help the watershed group identify the priority areas so that we can target the limited resources to the places that make sense. So this is from the Lions Creek uh, watershed plan and you can see uh, because we have this assessment we, we know where we can target stream bank stabilization techniques and, it, and, and there are certain things that are going to work better in the uplands versus the downstream areas and so this assessment work is vitally important at the local level. And besides that, you know, you're, as you do an iteration of a plan with, with a group of farmers in the watershed, they're part of the process. They're participating in this process, and I like to say this is their plan. They're identifying the strategies, they're agreeing to the strategies, then we go and, and, and help uh, secure resources to help them implement that plan. Farmer involvement is vitally important, and I don't think I really have to tell you that. Um, I'm going to talk briefly here about uh, some of the, some pretty interesting uh, nutrient management work uh, that involves corn stock sampling. Uh, it involves using that feedback and information in this program to help the farmer make adjustments in their plan. Uh, what, what, what we do is we provide coordination because this is one uh, sub watershed, a Huck 12. Um, all the yellow fields are corn fields. Uh, we will come in and fly, uh, do an aerial image of that entire watershed. So that image is, is looking at crop color and canopy. And uh, uh, we then go in and, and um, GPS sample locations within each of those fields, and then we collect stock samples from the corn stock and the stock sample is an end of season test so this provides feedback after the growing season near the end uh, of how well that corn plant uh, did based on its nitrogen that, that uh, was available for the crop and basically the, the stock test has been calibrated to give you an indication did the corn plant have just enough an optimal amount or too much nitrogen, okay? And so it's feedback. It doesn't really tell you what you should do next year, but it gives you an indication. It's kind of like an archer when he's trying to uh, sight in, in his pins. You know, the only way he can do that is to shoot an arrow and then go see where it hit the target, right? And then based on where the arrow hits the target, you make an adjustment. And so that's how this feedback can work in an adaptive management approach. So here's some data, and I just I think this is important just to show you an illustration of, of, of at the local level. So this is a simple spreadsheet. These are farmers across the bottom. Um, 700 to 2,000 is considered optimal. Uh, this is everybody's data. So you're a group of farmers. You're looking at data from collected from cornfields. Uh, within the watershed and some of them uh, were low, some of them are optimal, and some of them are, are above optimal. And immediately farmers are saying, geez, you know, I'd, my results, you know, if they share their results with their neighbors, that's their business, but we just lay it out there. And, and really all of a sudden farmers are saying, well, if I lost my nitrogen, it's not helping me in, in my yield. Some of these guys that are out here on the far right, you see 8,500. That guy's saying, well, you know, maybe I could cut back somewhere. Um, <laughs> you know, he, he applied a lot of manure or, you know, whatever it is. So, so that, uh, as, as over time, you can you do this over multiple years. 2004, 75% of the stock samples were low. Not only were they low, but those farmers also that lost their nitrogen were 60 bushel less in their yields. And, and so that's how farmers get paid, by taking bushels to the elevator, right? So uh, you see in 2005, um, you know, pretty average results. But for the most part, 2004, 07, and 08, low years. Well, why were they low? Just like this year, this is what we see in the spring. Now these are tile drain landscapes. 
Uh, it rains, uh, ni nitrogen uh, converted to nitrate is going to move with the rainfall and, and farmers are going to lose it. And so immediately you start asking the question, well, what, what the heck could I have done on my fertilizer management? Should I have put more nitrogen on? Well, if you know that particular year, you probably would have lost more nitrogen, depending on when you would have timed it. But one of the other things that we do is we all start we also start taking additional information. We look at um, was it spring liquid, spring anhydrous, fall applied anhydrous? Uh, was it no-till? Was it uh, fall tillage, spring tillage? What about soil types? And you can and, and, and the yield. I don't think I have yield up there. But the point being is that now the farmers have their data and we can begin drilling down and looking at which, pre which fertilizer practices perform better in terms of minimizing loss and making the nitrogen available for the crop. Which, uh, so, so the reality is some fertilizer practices are going to outperform others depending on the particular year and, and uh, the particular conditions. And so we're not telling farmers which practices, they're actually figuring out the probabilities for performance in their watershed. This is an example. Now the reality is, this is fertilizer management. This is not nitrogen and water quality. And um, one of the points I wanna make is that you know, we, we heard a lot of presentations today that looked at response indicators in, in the system, in the river system. It's my view that we have to create metrics in agriculture to talk, to talk about these issues. Your first speaker, and I don't know if anybody else picked up on this, but in Chesapeake Bay, they looked at flow weighted averages. That's actually a better metric, in my view, of, of communicating about how the system is responding because it's a combination of flow. It's a combination of, of concentration. How, how do we create a metric so that we can articulate and, and talk about the response of the system? And we can do that. We need to do that with agriculture. We need to be in the business of, of figuring out how can agriculture be successful in, 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 in talking about this. And, and frankly, uh, some of the metrics that we have might not be the best ones. So, you know, I just challenge you to, to work with agriculture to find those metrics that we can talk about this successfully. Uh, Dave mentioned bioreactors. We're pretty excited about bioreactors. Um, we even, uh, the Ag's Clean Water Alliance has installed uh, uh, six of these sites. Um, they're on the tile drainage systems. Just there's a picture of a, a, a bioreactor being installed. It's basically uh, at the tile outlet. We dig a trench. Uh, we fill that trench with wood chips. Um, this is a control structure that same thing that Dave mentioned for drainage water management. Basically, you're taking water out of the tile line. You have a set of stop logs. You're diverting the water into the treatment vessel where the, the wood chips are. And, uh, and then you're letting that water be in retention of the, of the wood chips, which is a carbon source, and uh, you can have denitrification. There's a picture of the, the uh, drainage control structure. This is where they're located, so, um, and here's some data. Incoming and out, out uh, going. Uh, this work, um, we worked with Iowa State University, the NRCS, and uh, the folks at the National Lab for Ag and the Environment names. Uh, there's an interim standard that's been approved and actually this is one of the practices that, that's uh, being provided financial assistance in the MRBI, which I'll mention in a minute, but here it is. Uh, this is the USDA program that targets uh, watersheds throughout the Mississippi River Basin. I'm really excited about this, uh, being a, a resource management professional and, for 23 years, uh, this is this is an attempt to target, and uh, you know I don't know how we can uh, not target with limited resources, uh, limited dollars. Uh, we have to target the MRBI. It's exciting to me because it's an opportunity to uh, 
help farmers apply uh, some of these technologies and, and receive some financial assistance. Um, I think these numbers are, they may be old, but 80 million uh, per year, uh, 12 states. I don't know how many watersheds are actually in it, but these are the ones that we're actively involved in Iowa. Um, we actually uh, worked with the soil district and the RCNDs locally to help um, write the application. Some of the watersheds that we've developed watershed plans and goals for are part of these MRBIs. The water monitoring that ACWA is providing is providing some support, uh, cooperative support in these, these watersheds. And, and um, we're excited about it. We want them to be successful. I hope we can show some progress. So in summary, I may have gone over, but um, I just want to reiterate, farmers are committed to advancing agriculture's environmental performance. Um, we, we want to be in a leadership position. We want to uh, we want to continue being profitable. We have to be profitable. We have, we're participating in a global market that uh, wants our product and we're going to respond to those market signals. Um, our strategy, uh, it's leveraging farmer investment. We have skin in the game. Um, it has to be a public-private partnership. I think that's going to be critically important. Um, the agencies aren't, in my view, aren't going to be successful in regulating this approach to non-point source pollution problems. And frankly, we're, we're likely to miss the performance that we're after with a regulatory framework because a one-size-fits-all regulatory approach is, in my view, is, is going to be far short of what we're going to need for a performing system. We need monitoring, assessment, comprehensive planning. It needs to be targeted and um, uh, at, at multiple levels, and uh, and it, it needs to be results based. Um, we, we don't have a lot of time. We don't have a lot of resources, so it has to be results based. What are we getting for the investment? And I'd be remiss in not thanking all our sponsors. Um, as as I said before, you know we're working with thirty. Uh, plus uh, organizations and group that provide groups that provide funding support. So, with that, I'll stop and try to answer any questions that you have. And thanks for inviting me. What a beautiful! I wish I had meeting rooms like this. Uh, great hotel. Uh, I hope I get to come back. I want to go fishing though, actually. So, yeah. Uh, any questions? Look around, here's the Lake Warriors left here. I guess there is a question here. So, so I, I guess this question is for you, Roger. I'm wondering what the thinking is in your industry about the likely impacts, the long-term impacts of climate change. Um, I think uh, we, we all recognize that there are more extreme events occurring and uh, we need to look at how can we be more resilient? And and in our in our work, you know, we're looking at those critical areas, and and you know, how do we deploy practices? So, really, from a, I guess the word is uh, adaptation perspective. You know, we we expect to see more pests, different pests, um, you know, those kinds of things. But in terms of uh, climate change, you know, is it or isn't it coming, you know, uh, we really don't engage in that debate. Thank you. Um, I, Gary has a question. I first want to thank, uh, before everybody leaves here, and we'll, uh, we'll ask some people to stay if they want uh, Q&A, but thanks the speakers, first of all, for coming today, all the speakers today, they did a great job. I think we were... Uh, we're very fortunate to have this quality of speaker. So, and then, thank, and then, secondly, thanks everybody who came. Uh, we had a nice turnout. They came, came and went uh, as the day went on. So, but really, thank you everybody who had an interest and uh, participated today. So, with that, I say thank you. Anybody who does want to stick around for a little bit of Q&A as the speakers are here and they said they'd stay, so we'll do that. I think we had one over here, but 
Uh, again, thank you for anybody who's got to go. So. Oh, thank you. This is probably not so much a question for Roger. Uh, I just want to say that uh, up front that uh, I'm a past president of the Minnesota Soybean Growers and current board member. And Mr. Legvold, who uh, I thought he gave, or I agreed with almost everything he said until the end, and then he mentioned he uh, basically said Minnesota soybean farmers are being obstructionist. And I want to say that, first of all, Minnesota soybean, along with the Minnesota corn growers, were the prime movers and funders of the Minnesota Ag Water Resources Coalition and the uh, Minnesota Discovery Farms. And the other thing I want to say is Minnesota soybeans, the Minnesota soybean farmers, are never going to be afraid to ask questions and challenge assumptions. It was Minnesota soybeans that did sponsored some of the initial work on stream bank erosion versus field sources. And we changed what the accepted paradigm was, and now we can at least have an intelligent discussion about what we're going to do about it. And some of the same questions we're asking about now is the effect of nitrate reduction strategies on methyl mercury, the long-term effects on methyl mercury production of nitrate reduction strategies, whether they're bioreactors or man-made wetlands. For that matter, the outgassing, and I know you're doing some work about that. Are we, are we giving off any greenhouse gases in these bioreactors? And as far as Lake Pepin, we also want to know, it's entirely possible in our minds that you could solve the turbidity without necessarily achieving the, without achieving the 50 to 60 percent reduction in total suspended solids if you address things because we know that the volatile organic compounds, for example, are much more reactive pound for pound. And on the other hand, you maybe could achieve that 50 to 60 percent reduction of total sediments and not solve the problem with the turbidity. If, if some of the things you use to reduce total sediments cause, you know, if you have more trees and grasslands that put more of these volatile organics in. So I just want to, and I think that's the same with every group, whether you're the friends of, whether it's the friends of Lake Pepin or don't be afraid to ask questions if something doesn't seem right to you or you think that more research is needed. Because the questions you ask are just as important as the amount of money you spend. Okay, thank you. Does somebody want to respond to that? All right. Any other questions? Got a lot of horsepower in here. Well, thank you. Enjoy a safe trip home. <laughs>